So um, my name is Amaya Kumar Jagannathan. Uh, I'm a specialized solutions architect at AWS on Microsoft Platform. And along with me, I have... Uh, my name is Robert Sigler. I'm a senior software engineer at Thomson Reuters. All right, so uh, in this session, we're going to talk about how Thomson Reuters used uh, Windows Amazon ECS to host our Windows containers. Um, before we get uh, uh, too far, I just want to know uh, how many of you have uh, heard of containers and what uh, container hosting services we have. So based on that, I'll skip a few slides if need be. If this level 300. Um, OK, it's kind of. 30, 70, kind of. OK, I'll make it uh, quick because we have a lot to cover. Uh, we're getting into the details of stuff. So um, we have two um, major uh, services which you can use to host your containers, Amazon ECS and uh, Amazon EKS. Uh, ECS is Elastic Container um, uh, a Service. And Amazon EKS is uh, Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. So ECS is our orchestration. Uh, service that you can use your Docker um, applications. And uh, EKS is our Kubernetes uh, environment. So with ECS, you can also host your applications, or you can launch your uh, applications in um, AWS Fargate mode. So Fargate is basically like uh, serverless for containers, right? Then um, with ECS, uh, you can, uh, and if you use Fargate, you can actually deploy uh, your applications without you having to manage and maintain your VMs, which you will use as hosts to ho to, um, uh, to to run your container applications. Uh, you don't have to uh, configure the instance types or network or anything like that, and uh, Fargate will take care of it for you. And uh, uh, ECS allows you to easily uh, host your applications, uh, any kind of conventional applications, long-running applications, microservices, or um, or it could be some, something like machine learning or anything like that. So any kind of workload is possible with uh, Fargate. It's just that your overhead of managing your underlying infrastructure is taken care of by, uh, by AWS. And uh, ECS also launches your uh, containers in your own VPC if you want to. And you can also secure it with a security group. Uh, with that, your compute is not being shared with any other uh, customers. So you, you have your compute, compute for you. You're not sharing your host with, uh, with another customer. Uh, you know, you know, if it gives you more isolation <coughs> for your workloads. And also, ECS is deeply integrated with other services like IAM, CloudFormation, CloudWatch, and uh, all other services so that you can, it makes it very powerful for you to use and leverage the underlying AWS platform as well when you use ECS. Then you have uh, ECS um, or EKS, which is Container Service for uh, Kubernetes, so you don't have a control plane that you need to manage when you use it. So Kubernetes has, has very, is very tweakable. There's a lot of configurations that you can change and modify. So uh, we make it easier uh, for you to host your Kubernetes uh, uh, orchestration engine on, uh, on, on, on AWS. And also, uh, it's secure by default. Uh, we establish a secure communication channel between the worker nodes and the control plane nodes by default. So you, you have a highly secure environment by default, and you don't have to work towards creating a secure environment. By default, it's secure given for you, just like any other AWS services. And also, um, we work uh, with the Kubernetes community closely. So with that, uh, we are able to leverage what's going on up to date. And we also contribute back to the Kubernetes community, which helps us and the Kubernetes community. At the same time, it's a win-win scenario for, uh, for all of us. And uh, also, we, are, uh, upst we run Kubernetes upstream. So basically means Kubernetes conformant. Any Kubernetes workload will be, uh, uh, you'll be able to successfully run on EKS. Then um, when it comes to Linux, Windows containers, and how we support on what service, and this is what it looks like as of today, right? Um, uh, if it's Linux containers, you can run them on ECS, uh, or ECS with, in the Fargate mode, or, uh, or in EKS. But when it comes to Windows containers, uh, we only support on, uh, it's only support on Amazon ECS. We don't, Windows containers don't have the Fargate launch type support, or um, you cannot run um, Windows containers on EKS. That's because uh, uh, version 1.5 of Kubernetes started the alpha support for Windows, and right now we are version 1.12 uh, Kubernetes. Uh, it still is not GA or uh, supported fully. It's, it's in beta, so none of the Cloud providers are supporting yet, and we are closely watching. And as soon as things get uh, stable, then uh, you will see uh, updates from us as well, right? And that's the scenario as of now. 
Uh, when it comes to .NET applications, uh, if it's .NET Core, if it's uh, .NET Core is definitely the future. It's much faster. It's modular. It's more. Uh, uh, it's 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 secure in several manner uh, in, in many ways. So uh, it definitely looks like the future. So if you have any new projects, you're probably already starting on .NET Core, which means you have many options. You have you can either run and run on Linux containers, or if you still want for whatever reason to run you know, Windows Server containers, then you can still use that as well. Also, you can run on nano server containers, containers too. But uh, if it's .NET Framework, uh, obviously it cannot run on Linux, and uh, dot, uh, the nano server does not support .NET Framework as well, because it is highly optimized only for a .NET Core, and it can only, only run 64-bit applications. So you're left with a Windows Server uh, container. Um, if, you're, if you have a .NET uh, framework application. This is great for Lyft and Chip scenario. There are many customers who have legacy LLB applications, in our case, Thomson Reuters as well, so um, that they have to use um, uh, Windows Server, uh, that they, they have to stick with .NET framework, but then they have an option and they can still run their uh, containerized their environment and host run ECS. Um, this shows how much uh, Windows Server container also has improved since, what, past three years. Uh, if you see in 2016, it was about 11 gig, and now it's like less than half of it, which is good, but it's still not the, the best. It's still 5 gig. That's a lot in the container world. So if you, and some of the containers are even like few megabytes, like 10 megabytes or even less. Um, so uh, because um, the concept of container has been there in the Linux ecosystem for a very long time, so it's very natural, and it was able to, uh, pick up and Docker was designed, keeping all that in mind. So there's a lot of advantages when it comes to win Linux containers. But Windows um, is trying to uh, fit into this mode and they're changing a lot of things, Microsoft's changing a lot of things. So um, it will get there at some point. But as of now, it's around five gig, still not um, as bad as, at, as it used to be three years ago. Uh, but still, Windows containers still need more uh, memory and CPU for, to run an identical workload uh, compared to a Linux uh, container. Right? So as of now, we have uh, Windows Server 2016-1803 uh, as host uh, on ECS. You can use that. And um, you, uh, when you're running Windows containers, make sure that you, you, can get, uh, you can get some issues if you are running a higher version of a Windows container on a lower version of host. So one of the best practices to like upgrade your host first before you upgrade your containers uh, because of the way how Windows works and there's no separation between Windows and, uh, and the container that's running there. So it's still not as um, modular as Linux is. And also because Windows containers can only run on Windows, so you actually need a Windows host to run Windows containers because of which you cannot have a mixed container uh, environment like Linux and uh, Windows containers in the same cluster. So because of this, you have to have separate clusters on ECS. So you'll have two clusters. Let's say in a microservice environment, your, all your new applications are .NET Core. You'll have that as a separate um, cluster, and your legacy application that is calling the APIs will be hosted in a separate cluster. Right? So you can make sure that your container is only getting launched on the Windows cluster by the, uh, by the placement constraint um, in, the, in the container itself. And uh, also the ECS agent, unlike Linux, it runs on the host. And you can actually configure it um, using PowerShell and uh, make sure that the host is actually joining the cluster that you want, to, want the host to join to. Right? And uh, next, uh, do not run Windows update in your container, so that's anti-pattern. So if you want to upgrade your container, so get a new image from Microsoft. Microsoft keeps uh, publishing new images with patches. Sometimes they are just layers uh, on top of the container image. Sometimes they replace the base layer itself, but that doesn't really matter. So you, can all, you should always um, get the newer image and uh, deploy your uh, layer, your application layer on top of it and publish to ECR and start using it. Uh, the idea is to uh, treat them as cattle and not like pets, right? And um, there, because of, uh, like I mentioned before, because of how um, the Linux ecosystem uh, has evolved uh, over a couple of decades, uh, the network uh, stack is not at, as, as varied or strong as, uh, um, as Lin Windows is not as, um, as varied or strong as Linux ecosystem is, because of which we only support WinNAT networking mode now. And uh, so you, you can, containers get like private IP on the host, and you can access the container uh, 
by through the private private IP, but you can do local host. At least you, you couldn't do until before 1803, but I think now you can. But there's on like this. There are many. Uh, there are there are few constraints that you will hit when you start using Windows containers because of the um, of the um, of the maturity level of the of the Windows container ecosystem. And also, ECS uh, container is uh, is open source. It's available on GitHub, and uh, we encourage uh, PRs uh, if anyone is interested uh, to contribute. Right. Okay. So having said that, I will hand over my control to Robert. He's going to talk about how they used uh, ECS and other things uh, to host their uh, legacy Windows applications on a Windows container uh, on Amazon ECS. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Sigler, and I'm a cloud software engineer at Thomson Reuters. Um, if you haven't heard of Thomson Reuters, it's a company which provides news, information, and tools for professionals in the legal, tax, and accounting, compliance, government, and media markets. Uh, if you've ever heard of Reuters News, that's the media division of Thomson Reuters. Um, at Thomson Reuters, I work on the Cloud Center of Excellence. Um, our responsibilities at the company include working with the business units of Thomson Reuters to help them deploy and run their applications on Amazon Web Services and to drive best practices and enforce policies in the public cloud. Um, I'm here to share my story about working with Amazon Web Services with you all, uh, the story of how we wanted to deploy our .NET services to Amazon ECS on Windows, uh, how we struggled with limitations around building Windows containers, and how we overcame those limitations, and our experiences running Windows containers on Amazon ECS. Our story begins with a Thomson Reuters product called Envio. Um, Onvio is a Thompson Reuters. Onvio is Thompson Reuters' next generation of tax and accounting software. Uh, it's a suite of cloud-based products for all aspects of accounting firm operations. Uh, behind the scenes, Onvio consists of many microservices, which are running production workloads in five different regions on Amazon Web Services. Some of these microservices run on Linux, but others were written to be run on Windows. And previously, these microservices were being run on EC2, but we decided we would like to migrate them to Amazon ECS. Here is a simplified diagram, which shows how Onvio would be set up after the ECS transformation, which I'm about to discuss. Uh, I don't expect this diagram to be surprising to anybody who has deployed microservices on Amazon Web Services before. Uh, Picture here, you can see an application load balancer, which has been deployed to the public subnets of our VPC. Uh, there are many microservices which are running in the private subnets, and they are being routed to by routing rules on the application load balancer. Uh, the containers are running on Linux and Windows Amazon ECS clusters, which are backed by EC2 instances in auto-scaling groups. Uh, before we go further, we should discuss why we wanted to change anything in the first place. Uh, one motivating factor for switching was that we wanted to see if we could speed up our build and deploy process so that we could deliver new features to our customers faster. Another reason was that we wanted to simplify our CI CD pipeline to make it easier to run and maintain. So as long as I was working with Onvio on this transformation, we decided to revisit CI CD as well. Uh, like I mentioned a moment ago, one of our goals was to increase our build speed, so we looked at switching to containers. Uh, when running on EC2, we were building our code and then baking it into an Amazon machine image using the Amazon EBS builder of HashCorp Packer. If you are unfamiliar with Packer, it's a tool by HashCorp which lets you provision images. Uh, the Amazon EBS builder provisions an Amazon machine image by spinning up a new EC2 instance, uh, connecting to it via SSH once that instance becomes available, uh, running the steps you define to provision the image, stopping the instance, taking a snapshot of your EBS volume, and bridging an image back by the snapshot. Uh, baking images is very useful, but sometimes can be a little slow. Uh, we theorized that our image building could be faster if we used Docker container builds instead, because that would eliminate the need for spinning up new infrastructure during the build process. We also guessed that our deploys would be faster if we switched to containers. Uh, when deploying a new container uh, using the EC2 launch type, it starts on an already provisioned EC2 instance, which may be faster than spinning up a new EC2 instance. 
Uh, one feature of Envio's previous deploy strategy was that we leveraged immutable deployments. Uh, we bake the microservice code into a new Amazon machine image and deploy that. Uh, this ensures that our application can auto-scale freely because new instances can be added to the auto-scaling group without any manual intervention. And similarly, unhealthy instances can be replaced when they fail health checks without any sort of manual intervention. Uh, we wanted to continue this practice, which using containers would allow us to do naturally because you can build container images. Uh, now that we've discussed the reasons why we chose to use containers, let's find out why Amazon ECS was chosen specifically. Um, Elastic Kubernetes service was not generally available when we started working on this transformation. And even if it had been, Windows support for Kubernetes is not yet generally available. So technically, the only choice was Amazon ECS. Uh, however, even if there were other options, there are lots of reasons to choose Amazon ECS. We were already using CloudFormation as our infrastructure as code solution, and CloudFormation can be used to manage ECS resources, so that was one reason. Um, the base Amazon machine image that we bake all of our code onto for Linux images is Amazon Linux. And Amazon Web Services already provides an Amazon ECS optimized Amazon Linux AMI, so it was easy for us to begin consuming that image because it matched the rest of our environments and we were already familiar with Amazon Linux. Uh, microservices and Envio were already using AWS IAM instance profiles to grant applications permissions without having to manage credentials. Uh, and Amazon ECS integrates well with AWS IAM, which meant that if we switched to ECS, we could continue to use it for managing our permissions, which was great. Uh, once we decided to use Amazon ECS, uh, we had to pick whether or not we would run it with EC2 launch type or with Fargate. Uh, however, Fargate is not yet deployed to all the regions we need, and there's no Fargate support for Windows containers yet, so we went with EC2. Uh, one of the focuses of our transformation was to rework and simplify our CI-CD process, so we decided to use Amazon Web Services code pipeline to deploy these microservices. If you've not used it before, AWS Code Pipeline is AWS's managed CI-CD service, so users can define pipelines as a series of steps, and Code Pipeline executes each step in sequence. Uh, someone might define a pipeline which says first deploy to CI, uh, then run a test suite, and then deploy to production. And a pipeline will stop if any one of these particular steps fails, which is meant to prevent band changes from reaching production. So if your tests fail, you don't move on to the next environment. A pipeline is triggered by a source action, which is used to grab code from a version control repository or an Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, triggers to your pipeline typically occur when you push changes to your master branch, but that can be configured. And supported repository locations include github.com, github enterprise, bitbucket, and code commit. Um, and if you don't use one of these options, uh, zip archives containing your source code can be dropped into Amazon S3 in order to trigger your pipeline. Uh, before we go further, I'd like to discuss the way we set up our AWS accounts at Thomson Reuters for CI-CD. Uh, first, for every project, we create a CIC or a pipeline account, and that's where CI-CD resources, like a code pipeline pipeline, are created. Um, and then we have application accounts, and that's where the actual application infrastructure lives. So an IAM role will be created in the pipeline account for use in pipelines, which has a trust relationship to a deployment role in the application account, um, and therefore, uh, the, pipeline, the pipeline can actually assume the deployment role in the application account, and from that point on, any API calls that are made are made to the application account, and new resources are created in that application account. Uh, so depending on the project uh, at Thomson Reuters, developers may not even be granted write access to the application account at all. Uh, in this way, we can enforce CI-CD. So the only way for developers to even interact with the account is through the pipeline. So we guarantee all code that reaches the application account has to go through certain checks and processes. Uh, for Envio, Amazon ECR repositories were created in both our pipeline and our application accounts. Uh, our intention was to reduce the blast radius of deleting images. So even if an image is deleted from the repository in the pipeline account, uh, there would be no outage because a copy of that image was persisted and being used in the application account. However, what this meant for us is that our pipeline has to include an action for pushing the image from the pipeline account to the application account before beginning the app deploy. So this is a simplified view of the, what the CI-CD pipeline we built looks like. 
uh, the pipeline has a source action followed by a container build, followed by pushing the image to an Amazon ECR repo in the application accounts, and then updating the Amazon ECS service to use the new image. Uh, details that have been left out include code compilation because we didn't make changes to our CI process for this, uh, or include that in the pipeline, and deploying to multiple environments because, as you can see, this pipeline only shows deploying to the first environment. I didn't want to have like another several stages in there. Uh, we ran into an obstacle, though, on our path to CI/CD for Amazon ECS, which made it a little more interesting. Uh, recall that some of the OnMule microservices run on Windows. They actually use .NET Framework 4.6, and the services make call to Windows dynamic link libraries, which would have to be, uh, so these microservices would have to be rewritten in order to run on .NET Core. Uh, so before we went and asked all the application developers to rewrite the apps, we asked ourselves, how could we maybe build Windows containers instead? Uh, we were already using AWS CodeBuild as our build solution for Linux containers, so we asked ourselves if we could use CodeBuild to build Windows containers as well. Um, and Amazon added AWS CodeBuild support for Windows shortly after our Amazon ECS migration work began, so this sounded promising, and we decided to investigate. However, switching our AWS CodeBuild build type um, to Windows and running Docker builds turned out to be unsuccessful. Uh, Docker was not installed on the image already, and all attempts to install it and run it from within our build project running Windows uh, proved to be unsuccessful. So why didn't it work? We wanted to find out. Uh, behind the scenes, CodeBuild creates new Docker containers for your builds when you run a build. Uh, we can tell that this is the case because Amazon publishes the Docker file used for CodeBuild's default images, and because we are able to push our own Docker images to Amazon ECR and use them from CodeBuild. Uh, CodeBuild projects running on Windows are no different than their Linux counterparts in that they also run on a container, in this case, Windows Server Core containers. Um, and the state of the art in 2017 was that there is no support for running Docker builds from within a Windows container. Um, supporting this would apparently require changes both to Docker and to the Windows kernel, and it didn't look like it was on anyone's roadmap, so it seemed hopeless. Uh, in 2018, there was a brief glimmer of hope um, as users found out that later versions of Windows may actually allow a container to access the host's Docker engine. Um, so if you mount the Docker engine volume onto your can container, allegedly it can be used from within the container. Um, however, it doesn't look like this workaround will work for us in this scenario. Uh, we don't know what code build projects running on Windows. We don't know that they're running on a Windows 1709 or later host. Um, and code build Windows projects do not allow you to enable the privileged build flag, which is actually required to access the host's Docker engine. So all of these discoveries led us to believe that code build cannot yet be used to build Windows containers. Um, some of you might be asking why we didn't run Windows containers builds on Linux, um, and as Maya said earlier, uh, the reason is because you can't, that you need, it, the container operating system needs to match the host. Um, containers don't use virtualization, and system calls made by a container go directly to the kernel, so you can't build a Windows container on a Linux host because there's no Windows kernel for you to interact with. Uh, so for this reason, you need to have a Windows host to build. Um, all of our discoveries led us to conclude that code build cannot be used to build Windows Docker containers yet, so we'll just have to build them on an Amazon EC2 instance instead. Uh, the only question now is how to integrate this container build with the rest of our AWS code pipeline pipeline. Now, one solution we considered was to use Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins can run on an EC2 instance running Windows Server 2016, or we could use an EC2 instance, we could use EC2 instances running Windows Server 2016 as build nodes for a Jenkins master. Um, and there exists a AWS code pipeline plugin for Jenkins, which allows you to add any Jenkins job to your code pipeline, so it'll run the job when you run your pipeline. Uh, therefore, we could use Jenkins as a build executor, which already supports code pipeline integration, so that's great. Um, however, we decided against using Jenkins for this case. Uh, one of my goals at Thomson Reuters is to drive reusable cloud solutions at Thomson Reuters, and we know that other teams are also going to be look, looking to, for this capability of building Windows Docker containers, uh, but they're also looking to get out of the business of maintaining their own Jenkins if they can. Uh, so one criteria that I was looking for in a solution that it should either be software as a service, hopefully managed by somebody else, or at very least be cloud native. So another solution we considered was running Amazon EC2 instances on demand whenever we need to build a container. Uh, we could provide a user data script to your run instances API call, which would contain all of the steps required for building your container and pushing it to Amazon ECR. Um, that run instances API call could be made from either a code build project or an AWS Lambda function invoked by the pipeline. So integrating with code pipeline would actually be pretty easy. 
However, we decided against this strategy for speed reasons. Each build would require starting a new Windows Server 2016 EC2 instance, so speed would probably be comparable to our AMI bakes, since we're still waiting for infrastructure to be provisioned. So the solution that we finally settled on was to build a custom action for AWS Code Pipeline, which would run on Amazon EC2. Uh, this solution allowed us to run Windows container builds faster than it would take to run new EC2 instances for each build, and with less management required than running a Jenkins. So a custom action is a code pipeline resource which lets you define a custom task that needs to be done in your pipeline. Uh, custom actions allow you to write code which can run on Amazon EC2 or technically anywhere that can access the Code Pipeline API uh, to implement a build or deployment task which Code Pipeline does not yet support. The way a custom action works is you write a program which calls the Pull for Jobs Code Pipeline API with request parameters which say which custom action you're implementing at a regular interval. Uh, and most of the time, the response is going to be an empty array of jobs. However, if a pipeline is running and the custom action which you care about is currently in progress in that pipeline, then the job will appear in the list of jobs that have returned um, to, your, to your code. Uh, your program will then call the Acknowledge Job API to tell Code Pipeline that you've received the job and that you intend to complete it. Uh, from there, your pipeline will download the input artifacts from S3 that were passed into your custom action, if there are any, um, and do whatever work is appropriate. When you complete the action, you upload your output artifacts to S3, if you have any, and you call the Put Job Success Result API to complete the job. Now, before you can deploy and use your custom action, you first you need to create a custom action type. A custom action type is a code pipeline resource which you can create via the API or via AWS CloudFormation. A custom action type is a versioned interface, so it lets you define the configuration properties input artifacts and output artifacts that go into and come out of your custom action. So you can think of these as being the parameters and the return type. I said that a custom action defines a versioned interface. So what I mean by that is once you've defined a custom action type, you can't change the configuration properties or the artifacts that it expects. Instead, you need to create a new version of your custom action type. So this allows consumers to use a version of your custom action in their pipeline without worrying about the contract breaking. So once you've created a provider name and version for your custom action type, that provider name and version can never again be used for a new custom action type in that account and region. So this is true even if you delete the custom action type and attempt to recreate it. So therefore, if you're like me and often uh, find yourself like actively developing something by tearing it down and redeploying it, uh, you might prefer to use a version which is randomly generated or derived from your git commit SHA or something so that you don't accidentally consume a version number that you actually wanted to keep and release like 1.0.0 or something. Now here's a sample of what it looks like to declare a custom action type in a CloudFormation template. So as you can see, you can provide configuration properties as well as the number or the range of allowed number of input artifacts and output artifacts, as well as a provider name and a version. Uh, once your custom action is created, it can be referred to in a pipeline definition and selected in the code pipeline console when you're editing your pipeline. So when you are implementing the code that backs a custom action, you need to write it to pull for new jobs, agree to run a job, execute the required steps, and then send the results of your job to code pipeline. The, the pull for jobs API is the first one that you'll call. Uh, that You'll call it asking for all the jobs which are currently needed to be run, and the API will return a list of jobs that it may choose to acknowledge and execute. Uh, the pull for jobs API can return zero, one, or many jobs to acknowledge, and it is up to your custom action to decide which jobs to take on. So if you know that your particular instance can handle up to three jobs, and there are five jobs in the pull for jobs response, then you can choose to acknowledge, say, three of them. The other two will continue to be returned by the pull for jobs API until some other custom job acknowledges them. So the acknowledge job API takes as input a job ID that your worker is claiming and a nonce. Uh, the job ID and nonce are values which come from pull for jobs. Um, and basically, this is your way of saying, this job is mine and I'm about to execute it. Um, if multiple separate workers received the same job from pull for jobs and all of them attempted to acknowledge it about the same time, then AWS will return an error for all but one of the workers. So the single worker who did not receive an error uh, knows that they are the they're the worker that the job truly belongs to, and they can execute without fear of race conditions or without duplicating any work. So AWS Code Pipeline's poll and acknowledge handshake actually guarantees that only one worker has a given job at a time. So due to the way these APIs are designed and used, a Code Pipeline custom action worker is actually really easily made into a cloud-native microservice. 
Uh, so for example, custom workers polling for jobs obviate the need for service discovery. Think of it this way. Uh, there's no need for Code Pipeline to be told where to find your custom workers, since the custom workers are the ones that are sending the requests to Code Pipeline. Additionally, there's no need to worry about deregistering terminated instances and service discovery because they stop receiving jobs as soon as they stop asking for them. So in this way, things like Eureka and Console, they're just, they're not needed. Um, in a similar vein, the job acknowledgement handshake that custom actions use is an alternate strategy for load balancing. Uh, so you can scale your custom action worker horizontally across multiple threads or even multiple instances without worrying about two workers attempting to execute the same job. Uh, however, you have to be careful. That doesn't, that doesn't scale forever. Uh, you can get throttled if you hit the pull for jobs API too frequently. So let's say your demand for your custom action is really high and you have 100 different instances that are all implementing the custom action worker code. Uh, then you need to probably develop some sort of job queue system to make sure that you're not hitting the API too much. The put job failure result API is used to tell code pipeline that the custom action has failed and is really, really important to prevent your custom action from dying without first sending the results to code pipeline. Uh, so if you were to, say, throw an exception and your app dies uh, before sending the failure result, then your pipeline would be stuck in the in-progress state until it times out. And a timeout for a custom action is one hour, so your pipeline would be inoperable until then. Uh, so, but if your pipeline does get stuck, there is a trick you can use to recover it. Uh, you can either rename the stage in your pipeline that is currently stuck, or you can delete the pipeline and recreate it. Um, and then you know, the, the, that execution will be forgotten, and you can continue using your pipeline. Um, the put job success result API is used to tell code pipeline that the custom action has succeeded. Um, so that's what you call when you say, I'm done, I want the pipeline to move on. Uh, but the pipeline, or the API can also be used to indicate that the execution is not yet complete, but our particular worker is done with it for now. Uh, so when you use the API that way, you have to generate a continuation token, which contains enough information for, your, uh, for the next worker to pick up where your worker left off. Um, and then you have to provide that to the API. And if you do that, Code Pipeline will later offer that job to a different worker. So we'll, we call the custom action that we built to handle our Windows container builds the Wintainerizer. Uh, it's a custom action which runs on a Windows Server 2016 AMI that has Docker for Windows installed, uh, so it can build and run Windows Docker containers. The custom action worker code itself is implemented in Java, and it uses the Spring Boot framework. Uh, here's a diagram which shows how the Wintainerizer works. It is running on Amazon EC2 instances in an auto-scaling group, uh, and it's frequently looking for new images to build, and when it finds a new job, it's going to build that image and push it to Amazon ECR. Uh, the Wintainerizer implements two different custom action types. Uh, the first is the Wintainerizer build, uh, so that it's going to call the pull for jobs API at a regular interval uh, in a scheduled task, and there are several different threads in a thread pool which are all configured to look for tasks, so each instance running the Wintainerizer will find and run several builds concurrently if it can. Uh, when a new job is found, uh, we will download the input artifact zip from Amazon S3 and extract that to a temporary directory, and that zip is going to contain compiled code binaries and a Docker file in order to build. Uh, we then run Docker build in a subprocess and push the new image that's created to an Amazon ECR repository in our pipeline account. Um, and the build output itself is going to be pushed to, it's going to, be pushed to Amazon S3, uh, where we can view it later. Uh, then we're going to remove the temporary directory and the Docker image. Uh, we're going to lose out on some caching by doing that, but if we allow for accumulation of all these Docker images and layers, uh, then eventually we have to be ready for our disk to fill up and our instance to fall over, and we would like to avoid that. Uh, the Wintainerizer also implements a custom action type called Wintainerizer Push. Uh, and we need that to run uh, image pushes on Amazon EC2 as well, because the Docker push command requires access to the Docker engine, and therefore it can't be called from code build or Lambda for Windows containers. Uh, we briefly thought about implementing the push action with AWS Lambda instead. Our idea was to maybe re-implement Docker push without using the Docker engine at all by using the AWS API instead. Uh, there are several ECR APIs that you can use for uploading layers and registering images to send a Docker image to Amazon ECR. So we thought about doing that. Uh, but ultimately, we decided against it because those layer managing APIs are meant to be used by an Amazon ECR proxy and not necessarily by end users. And besides, these Lambda function executions are short-lived, and therefore you wouldn't be caching layers which are shared between your Docker images. And caching is, is really important when you're handling Windows container images, which might have somewhere between 5 and 11 gigabytes of layers which are shared between every single image. So now I have a, a demo prepared for you all. 
It's going to show me uh, updating a microservice, uh, which is returning static content. And you'll be able to see it get redeployed and what the build output looks like. So I'm going to begin it now. Um, so right now it says, hello, reinvent it's static content being served from a Node.js Express container um, that's running on Windows. It says v0.6.0, and I'm going to change it to v0.7.0. This is what the, the project looks like. I'm going to modify the, or I'm going to show the Docker file. I'm calling the uh, PowerShell like OS version command to show you that it really is running on a Windows container. And I'm going to copy my index.html um, file to the location where static content will be served from. So I'm going to change the file to say 0.7.0. I'll save that, I'll update the version file in the, in the project as well. I'm going to commit these. And I'm going to push the commit to git. Um, and behind the scenes, I actually have a webhook set up, which is going to um, zip all the contents of what I just pushed. And it's going to upload it to Amazon S3. So then when I go to code pipeline, we're going to see that the, the pipeline has been triggered. And it's currently in the source stage. So it's actually copying the artifact to the pipeline bucket right now, where it can be read by later stages. And after that, it's going to run the Wintainer as a build custom action. So we can see it's running right now. Um, it'll be done. In, in a little bit, and after that, I'll show you uh, what the what the build output looks like, because um, that's going to get sent to to uh, Amazon S3. It's actually going to be sent to a static bucket, so we can see what it looks like in our browser. Um, we're in the push action right now. I think after the push is done, I show what the what the build output looks like. There we go. This needs to be refreshed. And there's the build output. We can see the Windows uh, server core like version, which is the, the Docker build is running on. Um, we can see the copy happen. And then we can see that it was pushed to an ECR repository with the version that we specified. So after that, we will go back to the pipeline. And we'll see that the, the push will probably be done shortly. And now the deploy is happening. Um, so once, once we think the deploy has, has gotten to the stage where the app might be ready, uh, we're going to go to the URL, and we're going to see that it's actually 0.7.0 now. So we've just redeployed our Windows uh, Node.js Express um, application using Code Pipeline. I think the, the last thing, which is going to happen in a, in a minute here, is I'm going to go to the pipeline execution history and show you how long it took. Uh, normally, this would take a long time, but this took, uh, I think, 3 minutes and 50 seconds. Um, there was some, some editing in the video, because I didn't want to have to watch it spin for, for a minute. So that's the, the Wintainerizer demo. Um, so now that I've described how we were able to deploy to Amazon ECS with CI CD, I wanted to describe how migrating actually benefited us. So one benefit was that we saw the speed of our image builds increase. Uh, when baking Amazon machine images, we saw typical AMI bakes taking at least three minutes, uh, with some edge cases taking over 20 minutes. Um, and obviously, that's dependent on what you're doing in your build. But we, we saw room for improvement even in the fastest of our bakes. Uh, so when building a Windows container with the Wintainerizer, uh, we saw typical builds completing in about one minute. Another benefit of moving to Amazon ECS was that our deploys were, were faster. Uh, when deploying to Amazon EC2 with an AMI, our instances typically take a minute or so to start up. Uh, but when deploying a container to ECS with the EC2 launch type, our containers start up in seconds. Um, ultimately, the majority of the time spent when deploying is waiting for the application to start and become healthy. Uh, and that's great, because that's something that we can optimize. That's something we have control over. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about some of the lessons we learned when working uh, with Windows on Amazon ECS. Uh, I have a quote here from Rich Adams, who wrote a very good blog post called AWS Tips I Wish I'd Known Before I Started. Um, you're probably wondering what that has to do with Amazon ECS, but I promise I'll explain the connection in a second. And the quote says, uh, if you have to SSH into your servers, then your automation has failed. Uh, what is meant here is that if you need to SSH into your, uh, for say, Amazon EC2 instance in order to fix some problem, uh, then that task probably should have been automated. And you're not really leveraging all the power that AWS has to offer. Um, and the same is even more true for Amazon ECS. Uh, there's no persistent storage for your container um, unless you mount a volume to it. So any tweaks that you're doing to a container would be lost in a redeploy. And you should treat it like, like cattle and not pets. And you should automate everything you need to do. Another idea from that blog post is that SSHing to an instance in order to view logs or metrics doesn't scale. It's slow, and the EC2 instances, that if you're running a cloud native microservice, they are, are ephemeral anyways. So how can you read the logs on EC2 instance, which was actually terminated 15 minutes ago by autoscaling? 
Uh, so the solution here to that problem is to send those logs and metrics uh, to a central location instead. And if log and monitoring are important when you run an application on Amazon EC2, uh, then the same is especially true when running on Amazon ECS. After all, your containers are now an extra layer away. Uh, in order to get inside a shell in the container, you'd have to SSH and then run Docker exec. So luckily, there are handy integrations with Amazon CloudWatch and Amazon ECS, which let you easily see your metrics and logs. So Amazon ECS supports Amazon CloudWatch metrics out of the box, which lets you see your CPU and memory utilization on your container, which is great for troubleshooting your application. I've used this before to identify situations when an app was under high load, and also to identify situations where I had, I had under provisioned my container in the first place and needed to give it more memory for the app to run. Uh, Amazon ECS also supports Amazon CloudWatch logs, uh, which is it's easy to configure automatic Amazon CloudWatch login by defining it in your task definition. Um, here's what like, a sample of what a CloudFormation template might look like if you define a task definition which has CloudWatch login set up. So all you have to do is you say log configuration, log driver, Adibus logs, and as long as you've defined your log group as well, it, it more or less just works. Um, Amazon CloudWatch logs make it easy to see the logs for containers. So these logs are actually going to be pulled from the output of the Docker logs command. So they're coming from the standard output of the entry point or CMD command in your Docker file uh, instead of from a file in the container or something. So because of this, there's no need to set up a log, a log shipping infrastructure or add log agents or sidecars to your containers because the EC2, ECS is, used, is doing all the work. Infrastructure as code. Uh, is also an important practice for managing resources in Amazon ECS. Uh, for example, we used AWS CloudFormation to manage our Amazon ECS clusters, and this allowed us to guarantee that our clusters looked the same in each environment and allowed us to reliably and repeatedly roll out changes to the auto-scaling groups backing our Amazon ECS clusters. Um, additionally, we used CloudFormation to manage our ECR repositories. Like I described earlier, we created separate ECR repositories for each app in the pipeline account and the application account in order to reduce our blast radius. However, uh, what we found was that ECR repositories cannot be deleted until all the images inside them are deleted, which made the early stages of designing our CloudFormation templates difficult because once we began to use an ECR repository, uh, the stack that created it could actually not be deleted until we emptied the repository first. Uh, and we worked around this by making our ECR repository resources depend on a custom resource. Uh, the custom resource invokes a Lambda function, which deletes all the images from that repository. And therefore, when someone attempts to delete the CloudFormation stack, uh, that the repository is automatically emptied and is allowed to be deleted. Uh, this was really helpful at the beginning of development stages, when I would often refactor my CloudFormation stacks. But I would encourage you to disable this or remove it from the template entirely in production. Don't want to wipe out all your images. So that brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, we talked about how we were able to deploy our .NET services to Amazon ECS with Windows, how we overcame limitations around Windows container builds, and how we benefited from running Windows containers on Amazon ECS. Um, thanks for listening. This slide deck is actually going to be posted online at a later time, so don't worry if you missed anything. Uh, I can take any questions you all might have. Um, we have a little extra time, so hopefully you have questions. Otherwise, you'll get some time back. What? Um, even setting up this uh, the CI CD infrastructure it was it was a while. It was at least at least two or three months, I'd say. And it, after that, it, it still takes a while, to sort of like get everybody on board with like this whole DevOps thing and, and get and get, get deploying to production, for example. It, it's not always fast. Um, we haven't had anybody come to us yet and ask for Windows ECS deploys because it is kind of a niche thing. You know, there's not there's not that many people in this room. For example, um, but but uh, we we do plan to to share that. And I even wanted to open source this, but I haven't gotten around to doing that yet because there's some uh, there's some bureaucracy to wade through before you can open source something. Yes. Right, right. Um, we, we did do that. And uh, the only reason I just stuck with Node.js and Express was because it was really easy to set up. Um, I, I didn't want to have to, you know, I'm, I'm running on a Mac here, and I didn't actually know how to, how to compile like certain like .NET uh, framework, like 4.6, for example, or ASP.NET or anything like that. So that's why I went with the, the simplest example possible. But there are like real like .NET framework applications being deployed with this containerizer as well. I, 
I don't think so. So the thing is, the actual, <coughs> the actual on-view application is .NET uh, 4.6. So just the, um, the demo that Robert showed uh, was based on Node.js and Express. But the actual application itself is ASP.NET 4.6. So it's in production. Uh, so it's a it's a Dockerized container. So obviously it is using Docker engine. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean Docker. It's um, it, there's a lot of lot lot of parts of Docker is open source and some part is not like. For example, Docker themselves, they have an orchestration platform called Swarm. They have another one called um, Docker EE. So, but the Docker core engine itself is open source. So Amazon ECS uh, makes sure that there is backward compatibility for existing customers. And also, there's no breaking changes. So we constantly keep updating the engine that is already put inside the ECS environment. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, this it, it wasn't like a huge change. I guess one of the one of the benefits here was that uh, um, Envia was already doing some of these cloud native uh, twelve factor app like best practices. Like these apps were not they didn't have state, so they could be auto scaled and scaled out horizontally, et cetera. Um, so it it was kind of uh, there was a little bit of a a learning curve, but it wasn't like it wasn't like wow we had a monolith and we containerized it. It was we were starting with a, a cloud native EC two. Application and we put it in containers. I'm um, still on the .NET framework. I think there so there are some DLLs which contain some uh, some code which they didn't want to rewrite. I think it, that the decision was made because the code is being shared between actually like some client some client software which is running on Windows um, and then on the servers as well. Um, so it's still .NET framework. Looks like we might have run out of questions, uh, which is OK. Um, there are more uh, Windows container sessions to check out. Yeah, uh, there are some tomorrow. There's the one, uh, Win314 is actually a builder session. Uh, you get hands on experience, you can do that. Or uh, the other one, I think, the one at the top, that's a breakout, I believe. Very cool. All right, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs>